Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. He is one of the most amazing architects in the biggest city in the world, and he's with us today. We've talked about architecture before, but I come to find out that John Riggio also was a tennis pro back in the day before he became an architect, and the stories go on and on, just amazing stuff with some of the best players in tennis history, and we're going to talk about some more of that. John is back. Hey, John. Good. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And just the the things I learned, and I shared last time that the names that you you mention are names in the tennis world that I remember back in the day. I mean, these are the best of the best of the best, uh, such supreme athletes. But you were up there right there with them, playing tennis with them as a pro back in the day. Uh, let's talk about the U.S. Tennis Center. Why don't we start there? Yes. So I talked about how I had court 33 at the U.S. Tennis Center. And there, there was one player that probably a lot of people recognize. His name was Vitas Gariolaitis. And he was really a, a captain of the, the pro players and used to organize a lot of the, the games. It would come down the chain of command from the administration to the coach and go to Vitas. And while I was there... I was on court three so many hours that I really became like an employee of the ATP and the tennis center. And they used to credit like a salary for my work there. And what was happening is during 1987 is particularly on court 33. uh, I started to do some things for them and I was testing new players because uh, with the pro circuit, a lot of people are submitting requests for uh, a player that they have that's a really excellent player. And uh, they have a, a list of players that want to see if they can really make it in the pros. I think of these players, there's like the number one ITF player, the number one U.S. collegiate player, mm. other people that maybe their coaches and sponsors are pointing out can really play good tennis so what was happening is they were bringing these players over to me on court 33 and in the extra hours that I was there playing I was also playing matches against these players and these are these are players coming in that were really like a number one player in their in their in their own group so it was very good Uh, I I played them and after I played them, I was would talk to Vitas and give them my comments about their playing and see if maybe they can make it in as a pro. And what happened was I played all these players and I didn't lose any match to them, which is really amazing. And uh, but I did I did recommend some of them. And so can, uh, I, can uh, I just better understand? Was it John? Was your job at that point to kind of vet the players out? Just, you know, kind of go through them and see which one has potential to go to the next level. Yes. Okay. Yes, you, were like the, you were like the screener. <laughs> you were screening the, you know, the players to see what they had to offer. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I had to really see if they could play really good, if they had potential to, to really play at the pro level. And um, even though none of them were able to beat me, which is good, um, I was able to comment on them, help a couple of them advance, they were given some uh, more games playing in the ATP tour for maybe like a week or two. And uh, and then, so overall, their experience there, it wasn't a bad experience. I think if you ever hear a pro player say that they went to to go to, to play in a tryout or get a chance to make the pros type of thing, that's really what they were doing. So they were getting a really good opportunity. They could put it on their resume. Hmm. And uh, if even if they didn't make it there, they could always go to another camp. Maybe they can improve their abilities. Maybe in six months they could improve their abilities, come back, play in the same pro circuit, play someplace else. So it wasn't a waste of money. There was some serious money involved with these games. It was like usually it was maybe like twenty thousand dollars. Even to, and, even uh, as a, a player, you know, an up and coming player, just to get to that level where they are playing with you, somebody who's played with pros, who's, who was asked by pros to, yeah, check these guys out, see what they got. That's like pre- pretty phenomenal for those players. Yes. I, as far as the money is concerned, I was not involved with any, any of the money at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, that of course is part of the sponsors and things like that. And 
but there was a, there wasn't always an idea that there was great value in in the games playing there. Some of them got to play maybe another two weeks. I think when I was there, I don't think any of them really were able to make it too far. It's that's just an example of how difficult the playing was. It was it's very difficult. It could take years to really move up through through the ranking numbers and and then and make it uh, in the pros. So we gave them a fair chance to to play. And of course, it wasn't a waste of time, but it was just very interesting. And with that, at the same time, uh, my Ali Pond bubble opened. So I was playing at both courts. So I was teaching at the other court, and that is the same situation. The I was I was really like an employee. The money was getting credited to my account, and um, I would teach players. And my lessons were valued very high. Uh, each lesson might go maybe. Just to give you an idea, fifteen thousand dollars for a lesson that I would teach them, and yeah, I think yeah, like, uh, wait, 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 wait. Press, press pause. Press pause right there. We're talking the mid to late eighties. Fifteen k is yes. a lot more back then. Fifteen k now for for that you know a lesson is is huge. But even thinking then, that like a ton of money. Wow, this is, it was serious professional tennis. Oh and from gosh. this, the my student would take this and they would go play a pro tournament. And when I was there, one of my students won the tournament. And so that tournament could equal a lot of money. It could maybe it could equal five hundred thousand dollars. So. The, the amount of money of of learning some advanced skills and then and then applying them and winning a tournament could be very prof profitable for them be well worth the money and that's really a, that's why it was a high level playing I I was told that teaching there was really like equivalent to like a Harvard professor it was really a top job it was it was it was everything was very expensive and of course they had built that whole tennis center for me because I was winning so excellently in the in the course. And then uh, at the, at the, at the, I was just had to remember at the at that Ali Pond, I did win additional five of my own tournaments playing. And so that was very good. And and then I, I remember they are playing. It was one very interesting thing. I remember one player really didn't want to play pro tennis. For some reason, he he didn't like playing pro tennis, and 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 then I I did help him out a little. You know, I, from playing the pro tennis, I knew other pro sport players and uh he, from talking to him he was able to get into playing professional baseball and i was watching the television one day and i see him there at the at, at bat he was he was at bat playing so he, wow. he was able to make it he he, he had, was able to get some some playing as a pro baseball player so that was the very interesting. So he had great abilities to play tennis and professional baseball. So he had the ability to play two sports. John, that that being said, I mean, you were an accomplished tennis player. If if you had to pick another sport that you would be interested in, or maybe you thought you were good at or messed around with, uh, was there one or tennis was it? Really, gymnastics was my really number one thing. And the thing about gymnastics was similar to tennis. They uh, they took the test and they could tell that I could win like a gold medal in the Olympics playing gymnastics. I mean, they so, so that was really why gymnastics was really my next sport that I could really play at a high level. That's, that was really the next sport I could play. Mm. With the, the tennis center, wasn't there at one point with, where it was closed and then – your fans rallied to to get it open again. Yes, what happened is uh, after Ali Pond, I was at the Sun East, and the Sun East, of course, was an excellent location. And this was around um, 1988. And what happened in 1988 is uh, unfortunately one of my sponsors, their son, unexpectedly passed on, died. Uh, Carter Cooper. And he died there. Um, but what happened was, so I went to the tennis center there in the morning, as usual. It was like a job. I had a planned schedule. And I see there's a there's a, a piece of paper on the door that it is closed. It is closed. There's unexpected um, personal <laughs> problem that took place. So I went home. And I just uh, eventually received a phone call of what happened. So the, the tennis center was shut down for a while. But what happened was, uh, since I had such a nice group of fans that used to come there every day, 
They used to watch me play tennis and were rooting me on. They all got together and they were able to get a representative. And he gave me a phone call and he kept the tennis playing going. He called the tennis center. So I was able to continue playing official pro matches. And the matches weren't at the bubble anymore. So this was like an emergency situation. What they did was uh, this representative was able to set up matches in different areas in in Long Island and New York City. So I was really on the road all of a sudden. I was playing at different court locations. Mm -hmm. And this and he would show up at every one of the, the matches. And uh, I played the matches. And from what I remember, I didn't I didn't really lose any matches. I, I remember there was one funny thing. One one they didn't want to show up and they wanted me to for some reason, say I lost a match without playing one. I mean, that's that was one really strange thing that took place, and I wouldn't do it. I would not. I would why, not. Why I would, would not say that I lost a match without playing the match at all? I mean, this was really unbelievable. Why? Did, why would they want to do that? Why would they ask you to do that? I I don't know. Maybe maybe they wanted me to do that, like to step down one time, and then from there maybe I would I would go up, you know, further. I don't know what the reasoning was. I don't even know who the opponent was. They wanted me to say I lost to. Very strange, and um, that 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 uh, happened. And uh, but I won all the matches. I think in that set, I remember one of the last matches I played Patrick McEnroe, and uh, I was able to beat him. It was beat him like you know six zeros zero. I mean that was so I, I was able to really to just go right through that that match. And uh, I won. I was still playing excellent, so everything was. You, going you great. said Patrick. Did I hear you right, Patrick McEnroe? Yes, yes. You know, I have like John McEnroe. It's Patrick McEnroe. Two different, not related. I I think they do say they are brothers. Okay, didn't know. All right, wow. And uh, yes, so that that was one of the last games, and then after that, later, um, I received a call from my sponsor from the Sutton East, and playing was able to resume. In by the next fall, by September, I was able to start playing back there again. So things were okay, and I'm ready to play the next season going into '89, and that. So everything was okay. Uh, but so during that shutdown period, uh, the, my fans really came through, and I was able to continue playing tennis, and they were really happy about it. And I was my percentage of playing was still the same winning really excellent and uh, it was good and i was on the road so it was a different experience i played at all different locations and that was a that was a, a, a different experience it was pretty good i think it showed that i could easily play on the road without any problem with some support you know someone <clears throat> setting everything up coming there watching everything videotaping all my matches were videotaped and um so every everything was was uh, working wonderful like that. So that idea of going on the road is it was a full possibility to do that. It was working good. I was I was winning and everything was working good with that. That's got to feel good. By the way, we're talking with New York City area architect John Riggio uh, about his tennis career. Yes, he's an architect, but he played tennis before that back in the day. John, that had to feel great. Here they they close a you know uh, a stadium. And you're not playing there anymore. And then they turn around and say, yeah, we want him back. Bring him back. That had to be so gratifying that you know that you have these people that are on your side. Yeah, my fans, they all love me. They really were doing great coming there, watching me play, that they were able to <clears throat> really come through and continue my playing like that. Hmm. What about... That, that was really amazing. What so about... there was one thing that happened at the Sudden East that I wanted to add was... Uh, sure. <clears throat> I had described that John McEnroe, who, of course, uh, was uh, sponsored by the same pro shop who owned by Patrick Mulroney. He visited the Sun East and uh, he had made an appointment. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with the appointment. I didn't know what it was all about. But like the next week, um, they told me that he had showed up and there was some outrage there. And what happened was uh, uh, they just. They, they talked to me and about John McEnroe and asked me what, you know, his story is. And um, and I had to have to describe the whole story. They really didn't know the whole story about how we had the same sponsor and that he was involved with um, supporting my tennis, too. 
He, he liked supporting my tennis. He was benefiting from it. And so from that conversation and with my approval, they were able to take John Macaro and they put him back on as one of my sponsors. They What they did was they made additional shares of my sponsorship. So my, my sponsorship was expanding. So it was, they had the main sponsors and they had people who still wanted to help me. And they gave, they offered him some shares of my sponsorship. So he was officially back on before, because in 1987 with the pro shop um, owner retiring, the official sponsorship was really ended, but now he was back on. So with, with uh, my help, he's back on. They offered him shares, and he could he could profit from my playing. And that was in in like early 1988. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that was really before all the big um, tournaments got going, where I was winning all of them. I think one of them was the Manhattan Open, and <clears throat> the Manhattan Open, very interesting, is really a world world known tournament. I think living here, they. A lot of people didn't know it, but when I went overseas to China, I was told <clears throat> by by someone who was who was one of the in-laws that was a uh, was really like a pro tennis player herself. And when they knew all about my career, they knew about the Manhattan Open. I had won the Manhattan Open. It was really a prestigious um, tournament, and I have a, a very uh, interesting story to tell you about the Manhattan Open. Well, one of them was uh, before the Manhattan Open even started playing, I was told I had to go back to the U.S. Tennis Center and I had to stop and check in there for my ranking check-in. So they made it easy. I went there and I drove up to the top player area <clears throat> and a few players came out and um, and they call over to me. They go, hey, John. We're all signing up for the Manhattan Open this year. We're going to we're gonna play it, and we're going to meet you in the finals. And, you know, it's going to be really good. We'll have a lot of fun. Hmm. So I went back to to play the tournament. And, like, over the next weeks and months, um, it came out that really they, they weren't able really to even, even make the finals at all. I think they were confident to say they were going to win and come and play me, but they really they couldn't make the finals. They, they, they. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> they they weren't able to really make it. And the Manhattan Open turned out to be such a big, important tournament at that point that I really got an idea of what was going on. Was that really the to, to <clears throat> anyone that doesn't make the finals is really like under the two hundredth player. Mm. So really, for me to to ad advance past <clears throat> that level. And and then win them hand open was really very prestigious, and that was that was very big. Uh, when I won them hand open, they had a big trophy there, photographs of me with the trophy. They're probably someplace, and uh, so that was really big. I want to find out, John. What I want to actually get in your head, what it felt like. So here you are, you know, you're barely twenty, and now you're surrounded by all of the best tennis players on the planet. Even still to the day, some of these names like John McEnroe and, you know, Boris Becker and on and on and on and on. When a new player would pop up or or be in your circle or they're going to say, hey, you're going to be playing this guy or you're going to be this guy's going to be watching you. Was it was it kind of a shock? Like, oh, my gosh, that guy, you know, he's huge. Or did it just become kind of a routine like, oh, yeah, yeah, John McEnroe sent him in. I'll play him. <laughs> you know, what did it feel like back then? I think since I started playing as a junior, I, I got used to the idea of playing people who are usually uh, big names, have good advertising, and um, are on television and things like that. It wasn't uh, that a big surprise to me, really. I, I didn't think it was a big surprise. And um, and there was, I think there's always, like with pro playing, I think there's always this, this two... Uh, a thing that's very interesting about playing with the pro players <clears throat> that I'm a pro player, a top pro player. And then a lot of times people might like read the newspaper or see a television uh, clip. And there's like, there's like two different, there's like two different things. One is, one is you would talk about someone 
on television <clears throat> that you would you would see on television, just like a TV show. And then, of course, I would then be really playing. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, playing you know, on the on the court. So that I didn't know was very interesting uh, that that kind of situation. <clears throat> so it didn't bother me at all. I was able to I was able to compete, and I was I was up with there, up with them, and and I, I was really as far as the tennis circuit is concerned, I was well known around the world. They all knew me by my regular name. That I was a tennis player, pro tennis player coming up. There was a number of other players around the world that, in fact. Um, were well known the same way that I was just told their names and that they were playing great, that they were they were coming up. They weren't really even on television that much. And so there was there's a whole world of pro tennis playing and, and people who are playing excellent and and their their names were getting circulated around the world of being excellent tennis players. And that that's really like um something that then starts to surface in like say tennis magazine or you'd watch them on Saturday morning. And things like that, and uh, and and people always used to see me on Saturday morning television. They used to recognize me playing there, and I think um, they didn't make that big a big bigger thing about it. They it's it was just very interesting, and uh, so so that was good. I think as far as like one name uh, <clears throat> when I first made the adult circuit uh, uh, rank of five hundred, and it just turned eighteen years old. The um, the coach of the all the pros at the time, <clears throat> he assigned Ivan Lendl as my tennis instructor. So he was instructed to teach me all the basic things from going from a junior player to an adult player. And that's that's his job. He was he was assigned to me. At that time, Ivan Lendl was writing his book, Hitting Hot. And he he uh had the manuscript for the book. He had the photographer down there and uh, the publisher was down there. So I was already learning about all different people in pro tennis and the publisher tennis, you know, uh, they were taking pictures of me. I have all kinds of pictures playing at that time, just get, just getting into the adult uh, tennis, tennis, ATP tennis circuit at that time. And uh, so Ivan Lendl uh, and myself, I learned tennis from him. He thought I was an excellent student. He, I, he, his comments were always like uh, that. I always listened to what uh, he he told me. You know, like uh, he always used to have this term, like he told me to jump. He's like, you know, how high type of story. And I, so I always did uh, excellent listening to him. I, I think uh, one thing about learning the, the someone's tennis skills and and structures is I had to learn all the basic requirements that were necessary. Uh, for the adult adult tennis, there were some more advanced things I had to learn and, and things like that, just, just so it, it looks good. A lot of it had to do with looking good uh, as an adult player, that you're not playing too young, you're playing more of an adult player. And, and that was very interesting, and, and I learned from that. I think one thing also was, since I had my own style of playing, some things that I learned I had to really, I still had to make my own adjustments I wasn't well, like a machine where he, you know, I would uh, say Ivan Lendl would teach me how to hit the ball, and then I would just do it. I it was, would really I have to improvise on everything he said. He's huge. I mean, even to the day when you talk about tennis, Ivan Lendl, huge. I know it was a long time ago. Is there any any tip that stands out in your mind, John, that he gave you? You know, something that he would say, hey, when you hit the ball, do it this way. Anything that you remember that came from from Yvonne Lendl or even John McEnroe, or any of the, the major players that resonated in your head and stuck in your head. It's like, yeah, you know what? I got to do it that way. Yeah, I think um, remembering his lessons, I think a lot of his lessons were really just to hit the ball confidently, you know, really take his lessons and, and really fully uh, uh, trust what he's saying and, and fully hit the ball really hard with the, with the instructions he's telling me. And then from there also, I think he was even even suggesting the same idea to take the lessons and then you improvise on them yourself to fit your own style. Mm. So from his lessons, I, I still had to adjust them. Now, I think one thing about Ivan Lendl, those lessons, what happened, He they had him come down to my court right there in Jericho. And this course, like I was saying, they, they were very valuable. Those lessons were very valuable. They were paid directly through the U.S. Tennis Center, wow. going through our, um, it went through the coach, 
of all of the pro players in the world come to the U.S. Tennis Center, and they have the one at the at the Flushing Center has their own coach there, and then under the coach was the captain. At that location was Vitas Gaelitis, and then from there they passed it over to Ivan Lendl. Then Ivan Lendl was instructing me how to how to play to to make all those adjustments to make the adult league, and uh, and that set up uh, the next step after that set up. Um, well, uh, after Ivan Lendl, since I achieved so high in the uh, athletic test, which I described before, I had the highest number of all the pro players. <clears throat> uh, I went from Ivan Lendl, they passed me over to Bjorn Borg. Uh, so, right before, the, right before the national tournament, they passed me over to Bjorn Borg as the, my tennis teacher. And then from there, I went in to start to play over to the national tournament, and that led over to the Davis Cup. I mean, that's really. Was and then and then in between that there were all kinds of tournaments. I mean, it was like I think like one month was like equivalent to like a year because I was playing all the all the tournaments. They even had me uh, playing with. Uh, they had all the females come down, and uh, they uh, had all the different tournaments heading over. Like some of them would leave and head over to play the French Open. Unbelievable. Like and then so that uh, was really good. Um, so that was really just just to give you an idea of what was happening at that time. So they had Ivan Nendo, who I think Ivan Nendo at that time was really like uh, like the premier player there. He was like a number one player winning. I think he had just won like the French Open or something. It was really big. They were all and, huge. Uh, you know, and we're just about out of time. But for anybody that's watching, listening, hearing those names, if it's not resonating with you, I'm telling you, they're huge back in the day. It's almost as if, Let's say, let's say, John, you were a musician and somebody said, yeah, over there, go play with Sting. Oh, when you're done playing over there, hit up Paul McCartney over there. When you finish, Paul, you know, done with Paul, uh, go play with Billy Joel over there. This is the magnitude of you know, I, I think around the world, everyone knew my name like a big star. Uh, they knew me in Europe. They knew me in Australia. <clears throat> they, they all knew me, my name. They knew it was just time to surface. In fact, Ivan Lendl was trying to help get my name into like Tennis Magazine. Wow, he was trying to promote my name a little. He was he was trying to get my name <clears throat> listed with a nice ranking and everything. I think uh, now I know that you name you went under a a professional tennis player's name, and I know there was a few of them that were that you used at that time. Was it John Vanderbilt? <coughs> were you using that name? I think the other one was Valentine. Which no, I was just using my regular natural name, John Reggio. Wow, amazing. The first, the first name as a junior that I was using as an Elias name was Jack Rackett. And, uh, but at that time, I was just using my natural name, and they were trying to submit it with my natural name. Amazing. We are just about out of time, but just fast. I'm, this blows me away. Just hearing those names. I remember back in the day, you know, those were the names. When you watch, like, ABC Sports, you would hear those names every single day, especially when it was around the time of uh, major tennis tournaments. If you want to check out any of what John has done in the past, he's got a lot of it on his website. And of course, as an architect in the New York City area, you can see more there at John Riggio, R I G G I O dot com. As always, John, fascinating talking with you. I, I could go on forever. <laughs> it's like hey, thanks a lot, Steve. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. 
This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.